Hi! There are two reasons why Halloween is considered a favorite holiday here at NerdKids. First, it's the only time of year where it's considered socially acceptable to wear a cape. And second, it's the only time of year where our nerdy contraptions are considered a sought-after trick. Since Halloween projects often involve springing in an unexpected trap on the uh, user, many late October projects often use some sort of proximity sensor to detect the presence of a victim. Many commercial products out there, as well as a lot of DIY projects, end up using a complicated distance sensor, sometimes an IR sensor or an LED photodiode pair. In this project, we are going to show you how you can use a nerd kit, some tinfoil, and a little bit of electronics knowledge to create a proximity sensor. We will then apply that knowledge to this spooky candy bowl that adds an element of trick when kids reach inside for their treat. The technology behind our proximity sensor is not at all new. What we've essentially built is a capacitive touch sensor, much the same as the capacitive touch sensor you find on your computer's trackpad or on your smartphone. These devices rely on the fact that humans are mostly water, and water is very good at directing electric fields. When your body gets near it, it changes the direction of the electric field, and therefore changes the capacitance enough to be detected. Trackpads use fancy tricks to figure out where on the pad you are touching but we are going to use the same technology to figure out the presence of a human hand. Let's go over the basics of the system. Say we had a simple RC circuit just like this one, with a resistor and a capacitor in parallel, and a switch going up to 5 volts. Let's look at what happens to the voltage at this node when I open and close the switch. When I close the switch, it's going to charge the capacitor up to 5 volts. Then when I open the switch, it's going to let the capacitor discharge through this resistor over time. Now how long it takes to discharge has to do with this resistance and this capacitance. It's actually the product of them. It's the RC time constant of the system. So if I was to keep opening and closing this switch over and over, it would charge the capacitor and then let it discharge. And the time it takes to discharge would be exactly the same each and every time, as long as I don't change this resistance or this capacitance. In our system, we use the microcontroller to charge and discharge the capacitor and to time how long it takes to discharge. But the capacitor is actually made up of two sheets of aluminum foil. When you move your hand between the sheets of aluminum foil. It changes the capacitance enough that you can tell by how long it takes for the voltage to drop because it takes longer for the capacitance to discharge. So let's see how we do this on our nerd kit. We are using a component of the AT Mega 168 that we have not used before, the analog comparator. The detailed functionality is explained in the data sheet, but what it basically does is compare two analog voltages and output a one or a zero depending on which one is higher. You can feed these voltages in to two specific pins on the MCU, but the analog comparator also allows you to assign one of them to a reference voltage known as a bandgap voltage. This voltage happens to be about 1.2 volts. We take the other pin of the analog comparator and connect our resistor and aluminum foil contraption to it. We set up the analog comparator to fire an interrupt whenever the voltage at this node becomes less than the reference bandgap voltage. In the interrupt handler, we record the current count of a timer. Then we change this pin to an output pin and set it to a high voltage, and then turn the pin to an input pin so that we are not driving it with the MCU at all. This has the same effect as disconnecting the switch. The capacitor will then begin to discharge until the voltage becomes lower than the reference voltage and the interrupt fires again. Using the timer, we can see the difference in how long it takes to discharge the node and be able to tell when a hand is near our sensor. Let's go over to the oscilloscope and see our circuit in action. Here we see the voltage between the two pieces of aluminum foil. The voltage is held high by the MCU and then is allowed to drop as the capacitor discharges. When it drops low enough, the interrupt fires and the cycle begins again. Now see what happens when I move my hand near the sensor. Notice how it takes longer for the capacitor to discharge because of the increased capacitance. There are many ways you could use this idea, but we chose to make a glowing candy ball that would glow when someone reached their hand in. The physical construction is fairly straightforward. We tape one piece of aluminum foil behind the face of the jack-o'-lantern and put another piece underneath it. Then, we just drilled a few holes for the LEDs. All tail LEDs are driven by a single PWM output, 
so we can make them brighter the further you reach your hand in. We hook the LEDs up in pairs. Two LEDs and a 680 ohm resistor in series are driven with a 2N7000 transistor. The PWM pin controls the gate of the MOSFET and turns the LEDs on and off. Let's take a look at the harder parts of the code. We have an interrupt handler in order to time the discharge of the capacitor through our resistor. We will later set the interrupt to fire when the analog comparator crosses the bandgap voltage. The interrupt just records the current time on the timer, changes the pin to a high output pin to charge the pin, and then at the end resets the timer before setting the pin back to an input pin so that the next time the interrupt fires, it can record the time since the voltage started to drop. This part of the code averages the times over 1000 samples. Things are happening fast enough on this system that we can afford to average over many samples and things still seem instantaneous. Averaging over many samples helps us reduce noise. Once enough samples have been averaged, the interrupt handler flips a flag and alerts the main loop that a new average reading is ready for use. All that's left to do is set it out and watch the reaction. I hope you have learned something about how you can take a simple electronics concept and turn it into something you can use to scare the neighborhood children. For more information about this project or more videos like this one, visit us at www.nerdkids.com.